blustery cold evening to our 10th annual Sonia Haynes Stone Memorial Lecture. As most of you know, this is our signature event of the year. It's an event that's done specifically to honor the spirit and legacy of Dr. Stone, particularly along the lines of us having a program that focuses on activism and connecting our daily vocations to being activists for social justice. We are fortunate this evening that we have a very dynamic speaker who's going to talk with you at some length about issues that we should all be concerned about. I'm going to ask you during the program to simply follow the program so we won't have to go through by coming back and sitting down and, and that type of thing. So please follow along. I wanted to note a couple of things before we get started. First of all, <clears throat> uh, on the outside, um, as many of you came in, you'll notice there's a table with a good amount of information rather than go through a great uh, long list of upcoming events. Many of you who know us know that there are a lot of things coming up in the next few months, pardon me, in the next few weeks. For students, I know you don't want to hear the next few months. But in the next few weeks, we have a number of things that will be coming up. Hopefully, you'll be able to make it to some. We look forward to seeing you. And uh, in many cases, uh, look forward to your participation uh, in those programs. Um, I also have been reminded to remind you that in a few short months, uh, an event that many of you have been waiting for, an event that many of you struggled for, and an event that we're going to be very proud to present, and that's going to be the opening of the new Sonia Haynes Stone Center for Black Culture and History. Um, that opening weekend, and we hope you'll mark your calendars, is going to be the weekend of August 21st and 22nd, and there'll be a number of events. We'll keep in touch with you, we'll let you know, and hopefully uh, you'll be able to make it. The last thing I'm going to do is a, a couple of acknowledgments. Um, if you will, I would like any members of the board of directors that are here tonight for the Stone Center to please stand so we can acknowledge your presence. Fred Archie, Jimmy Boyd, who's our chair, is also here, Aaron Davis, Clayton Perry. I also wanted to recognize our staff. Some of you see their names, but don't get an opportunity to see their faces. Please, if the staff will stand so we can recognize you as well. And also, um, I think we're fortunate. Um, there is a, a legacy that's sometimes written in stone, but we also like to have those real living reminders of why we continue to do the work we do. And if I can have the pleasure of introducing the father of Dr. Stone, uh, Mr. Haynes is here with us. If you please stand so we can acknowledge you. Today. I like to think of him as the father of the center, and we'll continue to do so. Yes, sir. Uh, I also want to acknowledge Robert Stone and his fiancée, Lynn Bolden, Dr. Stone's son.
friends, I come to you this evening to honor the life and legacy of Dr. Sonia Haynstone. Dr. Stone was born in Chicago, Illinois on December 14, 1938. She earned her bachelor's degree in social science from Sarah Lawrence College, a master's degree in social work from Atlanta University, a master's degree in social and ethical philosophy from the University of Illinois at Chicago, and a doctoral degree in history and philosophy of education from Northwestern University. Dr. Stone taught at Northeastern Illinois University, serving as the assistant director and acting director of its Center for Inner City Studies in Chicago. She also worked in the Cook County Office of Economic Opportunity in its Department of Public Aid in Illinois, as well in the, as well as in the office, excuse me, as well as in the Los Angeles Department of Community Services. In 1974, Dr. Stone came to UNC as the director of the curriculum in African American Studies and she served in this capacity until 1979. During her tenure at UNC, Dr. Stone worked with various advisory panels, such as the Black Cultural Center Planning Committee on Recruitment of Black Faculty and the Campus-Wide Advisory Board. She was also an advisor for the UNC Collegiate Caucus and the African American Studies Club from 1974 to 1980. Dr. Stone was the recipient of many awards, including the Black Student Movement Award for Excellent Academic Achievement in 1980, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People Woman of the Year Award in 1981, the Black Student Movement Faculty Award in 1983, the Favorite Faculty Award given by the class of 1990, and also in 1990 she was the first recipient of the Outstanding Black Faculty Award given by the UNC General Alumni Association. The life of Dr. Stone and her work with the black community at this university and at large are finally remembered. Dean Harold Woodard stated, I knew her as a teacher, a mentor, and a colleague. She was an incredibly insightful instructor. She kept challenging students to push themselves and become involved both in scholarship and service. That is the legacy she has left for us. I hope in her memory that students dedicate themselves to the two things that she stood for, scholarship and service. Former director of the Sonia Haynes Stone Center for Black Culture and History, Margaret Crawford said of Dr. Stone, she was a major spokesperson on campus and a social activist in the most powerful way. In the tradition of a Rosa Parks and a Harriet Tubman, she was a person who didn't just simply talk about solving the problems. She was a person who dedicated her life to strategizing and working towards solutions. She worked for the change and mission of opposing injustice to the last day of her life. When I think of Dr. Stone and the woman she was and the amazing legacy she left behind, I find it unfortunate that I was not given the opportunity to be blessed with her presence. My earliest recollection of Dr. Stone involves the Sonia Haynes Stone Center for Black Culture and History, where my mother enrolled me in the community program as a child. And I recall the wealth of knowledge and the sense of pride that the program gave me about being an African American woman in our society. As the university community stands at a turning point for African Americans with the opening of the Sonia Haynes Stone Center for Black Culture and History slated for the fall of 2004, I can honestly say that the life and legacy of Dr. Stone lives on. I once heard someone say in a movie, Hope is a good thing, maybe even the best of things, and no good thing ever dies. Dr. Stone was a vibrant woman filled with a desire to be a positive change in this world, as well as a hope for the future. While she has physically left us, her hope lives on. May we continue to let her legacy and the hope that she has had surround us and encourage us. Commission, 
which successfully organized and administered that country's first non-racial elections and conducted comparative analyses of excuse me, comparative analyses of constitutional orders. And equally important, yet often overlooked work, in both Namibia and South Africa, she assisted in the defense of thousands of political prisoners. In 1998, she was the first American elected to serve as an independent expert on the United Nations treaty body that oversees the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. In 1996, the United Nations Commission on Human Rights elected her to its subcommission on prevention of discrimination and protection for minorities of the Human Rights Commission. A particular note, in that capacity, she served as special rapporteur on the critical and politically contentious, excuse me, politically contentious issue of systematic rape, sexual slavery, and slavery-like slavery -like practices in armed conflict. She presented a study to the UN Subcommission calling for international legal standards for prosecuting acts of systematic rape and sexual slavery committed during armed conflict. This study implemented a paradigm shift in how we conceive human rights law. The study was commissioned for the purposes for which my student was using it, to investigate and create a legal framework for addressing the sexual subordination <coughs> of more than 200,000 women enslaved by the Japanese military in the surreally named comfort stations during World War II. In a testament to its innovation, the report has been cited by the International Criminal Tribunal as an authoritative statement of international criminal law in a landmark sexual violence case involving a Bosnian prison camp. Also in her capacity as Special Rapporteur, she toured Sierra Leone to assess the effects of civil war on civilian populations. Since 1994, Ms. McDougall has been the Executive Director of Global Rights, previously known as the International Human Rights Law Group. In addition to her conceptual and her analytic work in her studies and her reports, she is a widely published and frequently cited scholar with two books and many articles to her credit. She is a graduate of Yale Law School and earned an advanced legal degree in public international law at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Ms. McDougall's activism, her scholarship, her speaking, her teaching, and her leadership on constitutional orders and voting regime, regimes, on prisoners' rights, and civil rights more generally, have, mu have moved human rights theory and frameworks forward by at least a generation. And while some of us theorize intersectionality, or the interplay of race and class, and gender and sexuality, through her work on sexual slavery, Gay McDougall has performed it. And she has performed it with vigor and rigor, style and grace, and efficiency and effectiveness. She was awarded a MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant in 1999, for her innovative and highly effective work on behalf of international human rights. Today, Gay McDougall will speak to us on the extremely timely topic of race and poverty, critical frontiers for human rights advocacy. Well, thank you very much, uh, Adrian, for that. Uh, all too uh, generous uh, introduction. And um, thank you, uh, Aaron, for that uh, wonderful uh, remembrance of um, Sonia Haystone. Um, it uh, really made me very proud to be able to be a part of this uh, memorial uh, of her work and her accomplishments. So, I want to thank Erin for doing such a great job on that. Uh, it is certainly a uh, fascinating time to be uh, working in the field of human rights. Um, here we are in a new century, uh, a new millennium. Uh, while the Cold War no longer uh, dominates our vision of the world, uh, nationalism, uh, ethnic tensions, resurgent uh, racism, uh, religious divides, and the war on terrorism now are providing the fodder 
for armed conflicts. Entire nation states are collapsing. Uh, the world stands uh, more divided uh, than ever. Um, and uh, there's no description of the world that can avoid the terminology of division. Uh, you have the world battle lines drawn between the haves and the have-nots. Uh, between the industrialized uh, countries and the developing uh, nations, uh, between the North and the South, <coughs> and now between the coalition forces and anybody suspected of being Islamic. And any casual assessment uh, reveals that the masses of the poor, uh, uneducated, exploited peoples of the world are black and brown and yellow, while those who dominate look very different. While the United Nations has uh, grown in uh, prominence, um, it is now, I think, taking on legitimately the a uh, role of the voice of the international community, and it plays a wide range of, of uh, roles from uh, peacekeeping to interim government. Uh, but still, American unilateralism has been able to undermine 50 years of international cooperation. And the attack on the UN headquarters in Baghdad may forever symbolize the crisis of faith in compacts for peace in the world. Uh, the uh, uh, embargo against Cuba, uh, to my amazement, is still there. Uh, but uh, the international community and human rights ad advocates as a whole are now uh, reconsidering and reassessing the morality and the efficacy uh, of sanctions. Pol Pot is dead, and uh, efforts are underway to bring uh, members of the Khmer Rouge to trial in Cambodia. Milosevic is on trial in The Hague, uh, but at the same time, Charles Taylor, the uh, former dictator of Liberia, has been given asylum in Nigeria. Uh, apartheid, I'm very happy to say, is gone, and black South Africans have been enfranchised. Uh, but at the same time, here in the United States, 1.4 million black men have been disenfranchised uh, because of the indiscriminate war on drugs. Um, and women in countries all over the world are denied the right to make even the most fundamental of decisions about their own lives and their own bodies. Uh, this year we celebrate, and I'm very excited that I'm going to celebrate the uh, 10th anniversary of the first free and fair and non-racial elections uh, in South Africa. But at the same time, we are mourning the 10th anniversary of genocide in Rwanda. And while the U.S. government touts democracy as the only basis upon which it will give uh, foreign assistance uh, to a country. Uh, nevertheless, it plays a pivotal role in the ousting of a democratically elected president in Haiti. So during the last 10 years or so, we have actually seen um, many hard-fought victories in the worldwide uh, human rights struggle. And we've seen some really terrible failures. And from these struggles, we have uh, learned important lessons 
uh, about the fundamental principles that are necessary to put in place to undergird uh, a human rights uh, culture. Uh, the universality of human rights, the principle of equality and non-discrimination, uh, respect for the rule of law and um, an end to uh, impunity, uh, the rights of women, um, and the importance of economic, social, and cultural rights. Uh, we made some great strides uh, in these areas, and um, yet there are great distances uh, to go. And so tonight I just want to talk about three areas that I really think are very crucial um, as we look forward uh, at this new century uh, that we're in. Uh, number one, uh, the issue of poverty, which right now is being uh, driven by the forces of economic globalization. Uh, number two, uh, racism, and in this I mean uh, ethnic discrimination as well. And number three, uh, discrimination against women. Here are some important questions. Does a homeless man have a right to housing? Does a pregnant woman have a right to prenatal health care? Do the 29 million people in Africa who will die of HIV AIDS have a right to life-sustaining drugs that they cannot afford? Uh, does the one half of the population of the world that lives in abject poverty have a right to feed their children when there are masses of surplus food in other countries. Now, the government of the United States of America, our government, uh, both Democrat and Republican, answer these questions by saying, no, these are not rights. Uh, the global economy owes nothing to these poor beggars. And in many ways, I'm sorry to say that to date, the human rights movement, at least in this country, has gone along with that. Uh, we've been very good at protesting the jailing of political prisoners in other countries, or the denial of the right to vote or even the death penalty. I mean, we've been good at focusing our uh, efforts on denouncing abuses uh, committed by repressive uh, regimes around the world. And we've, we've been very successful in, in many cases in this. Um, for example, at establishing judicial tribunals uh, uh, for abuses of um, human rights and, and for war crimes, like the International Criminal Tribunal, which is a tremendous leap forward in the human rights uh, world. Uh, so we've been very comfortable at advocating for civil and political uh, rights. But we've been very negligent. And actually, we've been near refusing to acknowledge uh, or to protect and enforce economic um, and social rights. And these are the rights that are uh, most centrally uh, in, involved, abused, in the process of economic globalization. What's clear to me is that if we are to become, as we must, uh, effective countervailing forces for economic globalization, then we've got to take on some new tactics here. <clears throat> Poverty is a global problem of huge, huge proportions. Of the six billion people alive in the world today, 2.8 billion live on less than $2 
dollars a day. 1.2 billion live on less than one dollar a day. Uh, six infants out of every 100 who are born in the world today will never live till their first birthday. Um, eight out of every 100 won't survive to see their fifth birthday. And of those who do reach school age, nine boys and 14 girls out of every 100 will never see the inside of a school room. Extreme poverty is a human rights abuse. The rights to work, um, an adequate standard of living, housing, food, uh, health and education lie at the heart of what a human rights regime is about. Dignity, <coughs> the right to life, freedom from want. But these are not the norms or the standards that are driving uh, the current global economy. Uh, you know, this is, it, it really is a new um, era. Uh, the world has uh, changed in um, dramatic uh, ways. You know, it used to be that governments were the entities that wielded uh, power um, and had control over the political and the economic and the civil and, you know, uh, forces inside a country. <clears throat> but today, globalization has really changed that paradigm by empowering certain institutions to enable them to just supersede governmental authority. Uh, multinational corporations, uh, international investment finance, uh, the World Trade Organization, the International Monetary Fund, the uh, World Bank, now play an unprecedented role in economic affairs of governments and individuals and, and, and communities around the globe. Uh, the power and the wealth of these institutions eclipses that of many nation states, and yet, they are under no obligation to protect the rights of the people in those countries. Uh, they are so powerful that they can dictate national policies in countries, but they have no obligation. They operate totally outside any system of accountability to the people whose lives they impact. Uh, so the human rights movement has got to develop new methods to hold these powerful global actors responsible for the protection of fundamental rights. It's obvious, isn't it, that development in the world at this point, benefits of it are simply not equally shared. Uh, the economic and the uh, political and the cultural dominance of North America and um, Europe are being maintained, but at the expense of uh, countries and peoples in the other part of the world. Uh, human, and the cost of this exclusion, by the way, is really very high to all of us. Uh, human, natural, um, and, and cultural resources are being wasted. Uh, cycles of poverty uh, create suffering and pools of resentment, uh, which can lead to very costly violence and armed conflict. You know, when I travel around, uh, and I, I, I do a, a lot of traveling, <clears throat> you know, 
there is really a whole world of extremely poor people living more or less on the margins of their societies. They're hungry. They're brutalized by police. They're excluded from uh, politics. Uh, they're vilified or uh, maybe at best ignored uh, by the media. And they're pitted against one another. I mean, just look here in the United States, you can see that the gap between the rich and the poor is expanding. Um, this is as clear, you know, if you go to the Mississippi Delta or uh, the Little Pines Reservation in South Dakota, as it is clear if you go to New Delhi or Soweto or Sao Paulo. And the vast majority of the world's poor are people of color. Uh, racial discrimination, past and current, remains a potent force in today's world. Uh, the uh, racial tragedies uh, of the past, uh, the transatlantic slave trade, uh, the conquer of uh, indigenous peoples, uh, colonialism, well, they established patterns of racist exploitation that still demarcate the global fault lines that divide the benefits of economic globalization from the dregs of globalization, the winners from the losers, the rich from the poor, the north from the south. It, it, it's still the map of economic domination uh, in the world. So it's further entrenching these historical patterns while it creates some new patterns all its own. Um, in many countries, racism is both cause and effect of underlying socioeconomic <coughs> inequalities. Uh, groups that uh, face racial discrimination are denied access to uh, land, to wealth, employment, education, health, social sciences, social services, uh, law enforcement uh, protection, and protection of their environment. And when I talk about this, I fully include indigenous peoples because they are submitted to gross and systematic discrimination every place in the world. And Xenophobia and uh, discrimination against immigrants is increasingly uh, widespread in the northern uh, countries. Um, phrases like uh, restricted immigration policies, uh, aliens, uh, migrants, are today's code words for racist views everywhere. So it's clear to me that race and poverty are inextricably linked. We cannot address the problems of the global economy without tackling the reality of racism, racial discrimination, and xenophobia. And there's also a striking intersection between race, world poverty, and gender. The vast, vast majority of the people in the world who are poor are women, and they're women of color. 1.3 billion people living in abject poverty, vast majority of women. Um, we could talk about a lot of barriers to uh, the equality uh, of women. I mean, they come from law, they come from uh, custom, culture, uh, religion.
religion, family. Uh, they're imposed by national policies or international institutions like uh, the World Bank, the IMF, structural adjustment policies. You've, I'm sure, heard this a million times. Uh, many of the rights um, that are uh, violated against women grow out of attempts to control them uh, in their families, uh, in their uh, communities, in their cultures. Uh, but it is so much more effective. In fact, it is the linchpin of effectiveness of this control that women do not have economic options of their own. And, you know, the other thing is that when you wind up a woman, uh, a poor woman, of a racial minority, I can't tell you how lowly you are regarded in some cultures. And so much so that violence against you is accepted with impunity, accepted by everybody, including your family. I mean, honor killings, dowry uh, killings, uh, domestic uh, violence. I, you know, um, I, I really can't give you the full sense of how lowly women of color are considered in many, uh, many countries. So. When I think of the challenges uh, of this new uh, century in securing uh, human rights, I think about race, I think about gender, um, and I think about the forces of globalization, economic globalization. I think about finding a way to bring the human rights movement uh, to the service of those who will be leading the struggle in this new era. And they will be the victims of the past era. They will be the dispossessed Aborigines in Australia. They are the unemployed, the homeless, and the impoverished in New Orleans, and Nairobi, and Sao Paulo, and Sarajevo. They are the prisoners languishing behind bars in Virginia and New Delhi. They are the sweatshop laborers in New York, California, Mexico, and Bangladesh. The Kurds in Turkey, the Tibetans in China, the Palestinians, the Tamils in Sri Lanka. They are the Roma in Eastern Europe the indigenous peoples in Peru, the Mexicans in Texas, the blacks in North Africa, the ethnic Albanians in Kosovo. They are the women living on the desperate intersection of race, poverty, and gender. And the Mexican women working in the maquiador industries on the Mexico-American border women from Southeast Asia trafficked into the United States every year for sweatshops. Undocumented migrants from Central America doing seasonal uh, harvest uh, work on farms. Uh, they are the Haitian boat people. They're coming again. Women desperately clutching their babies to their breasts on the most perilous journey you can imagine across those borders, only to be turned around and deported the minute they get in U.S. borders. And they are the poor <coughs> African-American women trapped in slavery-like situations, abusive, working conditions in industries like the catfish farming operations in Mississippi. The reality of our times 
is that there is no longer a dividing line between the foreign and the domestic. Uh, we wear clothes made in Mexico and Taiwan. We drive cars uh, that are labeled Japanese, but they are made here in the United States. Uh, we use the internet to talk to people that we will never uh, meet. And we turn on CNN and we watch a war being waged in a remote province in a country on the other side of the world. We live in an interrelated, interdependent world where countries on the opposite sides of the globe are inextricably linked. Their economies are inextricably linked, and so too are their social problems. Uh, when we speak here in the United States today of institutional racism, well, the institutions we're talking about are such that they span national boundaries, and they defy anybody's traditional notion of jurisdictional uh, limits. There is no way today that transnational corporations or these gigantic uh, institutional investors can be regulated by any one country's civil rights laws. There is no way the social problems like racial discrimination or gender discrimination or poverty can be dealt with in any one country without reference to the global context in which they are uh, arising. To do human rights work in this century effectively, we have got to find ways to unite across borders and across identities. Uh, we have got to find effective ways to form global networks with activists facing similar problems in their own countries. Uh, we've got to devise innovative transnational strategies to put in check the negative aspects of globalization and to impose a human rights framework to shape globalization into a force for equality. This is not going to be an easy task. But it is incumbent on all of us uh, to take on this task, to raise a new voice in uh, national and international um, debates and discourse for a sane and um, a humane global policy. Um, you know, if 9-11 taught any of us anything, it should have been that each one of us now bears the responsibility, each one of us, for seeing that this world turns out to be a just world. It's the only way it's going to be a peaceful world. Um, and so um, I challenge all of you uh, to find ways to take on this task. <coughs> it's not an easy task, but it's one that we cannot turn our backs on. So I, I want to thank you um, again for inviting me uh, here. It's always great for me to be on um, university campuses. It's like a respite uh, to be able to be with people who can think <laughs> a while. Um, and I challenge you to think about this. Um, I think we all need your advice. Uh, we all need your uh, activism. Thank you very much, Jeff, for inviting me here.
how do you really move this mountain? Um, so I guess my question is beyond awareness, which I think is, you know, if you could just tell one more person the truth about something or some pain, you've done something to hopefully alleviate it. But beyond just simple awareness, you know, in some sense I hear in your speech that, I mean, your, your, your comments is that we're talking about a paradigm shift that's needed, like the way we think about rights, the way we think about what is what are people's inherent rights versus a privilege or versus what you can take with force or might, and those who have and those who have not are based on who are mighty and who are not. At some point beyond that, how do you, and I heard you speak about networks and coalitions, et cetera, at some level, I, I felt like, and I, and I was sort of inspired in, the, uh, in New York State Senate elect, election with Hillary Clinton winning, at the last second, like out of nowhere, she whooped this you know, guy by a million votes, and they looked at her, who voted for her, but well, those women who didn't get up and tell their husbands who they were gonna vote for, and voted for her, and a whole bunch of people of color that did the same thing. So at some level, I thought to myself, is a part of the solution getting more diversity into the decision makers so that we can think about our children, think about our women. These are the people who are poor and who are hurting around the world, women and children. Is, in, is some of the solution using this democracy that we're building all these bombs to protect, actually using it locally or domestically, if you will, to get more voices, more players, more people that are different than the typical you know, Democrat Republic, what's the same about it is usually as white men having a conversation about everybody else and what all happened. Well, let, let, let me, uh, because you're raising so many uh, points here. <laughs> but, um, look, first of all, I think it is very important that you tell people what you have seen out there in the rest. One of the problems is that uh, we are so isolated in the United States. We think a lot of ourselves here. Mm -hmm. And the first thing we think is that we don't need to know anything else. And that is a damn lie. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I think we need to, you need to encourage everyone to reach out and try to understand the rest of the world. Um, there's a lot to learn that's a benefit to us. Um, and there's a lot to learn to open eyes. So awareness is Awareness is a big, big step forward, and most people in this country don't have it. So that's number one. Number two is that part of the awareness is understanding that there are answers out there. And you don't have to come back and uh, feel depressed. In fact, the thing that has kept me going through my 30-year career, through refugee camps and all of this, is that out there I meet some people who have some dynamite ideas about how to deal with all of this. And not only dynamite ideas, they have courage. And they're fighting an uphill battle that looks much more daunting than that that we are fighting here. So that's number two. Um, number uh, three is that uh, don't, uh, don't miss the point that we've got a lot of levers here. Now, I think the Secretary General of the UN uh, did a really great thing in uh, pulling together the Millennium Conference and setting out Millennium Goals. And, you know, some of them look quite daunting. To cut poverty, world poverty, in half by the year 2015, it's totally doable. And you know where it's doable? In Idaho, South Dakota, Wyoming, Wisconsin, the farm states where rich fat guys, I don't mean small mom and pop farmers, I mean rich fat agribusiness people are getting farm subsidies that undercut the agricultural production in most developing countries. I think that if we could get those farm subsidies lifted, we're halfway there if not more. So that's a real target for you. Get the farm subsidies cut out. And farmers, small farmers in every developing country that you can name will have a new lease on life. And that will go far more than any, you know, uh, farm assistance that we might be able uh, to pass out. Finally, uh, we've got a tremendous responsibility. And that, 
You know, we, we say we have democracy here. Our democracy is very, very ill. And um, we got to fix it. And uh, it is, uh, the illness is not only spewing over on all of us. It's the whole world. And so in all of the countries that I work in, which is more than 22 countries around the world, everybody in all those countries says that the thing that's most important for me to do right now is to get a government here that understands the rights of people around the world and will put in place sane policies. Sane. That's a minimum <laughs> requirement policy. So we got a lot to do here. Uh, we don't have to sit around thinking, oh my God, what is there to do? We got some hardcore work to do, and we got a few months to do it in. So, there. Okay. <laughs> Declaration on Human Rights, I, I, I must say, I, you know, I'm constantly amazed as I rediscover it. It was really quite a revolutionary document. You know, the, the concept that all people are equal sounds really um, straightforward and ordinary to us, but it was groundbreaking. Think back on history. Uh, feudalism, what did you know? You know, the concept that all people are equal, we all don't even have it right yet. Um, and so this document is one that embodies the aspirations of people around the world. It has set a standard for everybody, including those in our country. Uh, it has been elaborated in a number of other human rights treaties that have taken each provision and work them out to say a little more about what they mean. Uh, it's been really groundbreaking. Um, I don't think you can underestimate um, those words of um, equality. Um, and I, you know, I mean, you know, I'm no pushover. I think they're really profound. Cuba uh, several times uh, over the years. I mean, I first went in 1970, and uh, last time I was there last year. And, um, you know, Cuba is an extraordinary place. Um, and uh, it's not a perfect place, but it's extraordinary in that it has tried. I see you back there. I'll call you next. It's tried, <laughs> it's tried hard to address some issues that we hear, you know, that our governing forces have said they don't want to address. You know, it's, it's, it's looked at the issues that I raised in my, my talk and said, well, let's see, how do we make this place a little more equal? Um, how do we get rid of, you know, want? Or how do we close the gap between rich and poor? And how do we deal with racism, which was, you know, rampant? And, um, you know, how do we deal with the need for health care? And in those areas, it's made great strides. Now, it's been, uh, they're constrained because it was considered uh, very threatening, these ideas. Um, and, uh, you know, it played out in the Cold War. Uh, but if you go to Cuba, you'll see now basically a black nation. And while I won't say that racism or racial differences have been totally wiped out, um, I will say that they've had a very good chance at it. Um, and they've gone, they've been alert to it. That's been their goal. And I think that takes a long way. Um, they struggled. Uh, they made mistakes. Uh, their mistakes have not been greater than ours. Just different. Yes, ma'am.
question. You spoke minimally about the problems in Haiti, and you spoke about how the United States reacted to Haiti. And in a way, the United States put Haiti in the situation it was in a long time ago with like just the different stuff that we did. And Haiti held shit for us in like World War II. Haiti was like one of the first countries to sign up to the UN, and a lot of people are not going to the aid of Haiti. And my question is almost like hers. I know you say you travel a lot, but how do you really, how do you feel about the situation in Haiti right now? And what do you think is going to come of that? Well, you know, I, I must say I've been so mad about Haiti, I haven't been able to actually talk to it. I feel you. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, last year, there were a rash of books that came out, I don't know if you, any of you have been at all interested, about the founding fathers of the United States, you know, Jefferson, Washington, all that. And it's very interesting, because a lot of them talk about race issues. And it's very interesting that uh, when you read those, there's always a little bit about, you know, because Haiti became independent there. And uh, Jefferson, uh, his position was that, you know, sort of, he will do anything possible to keep an independent Haiti from being a success. Because it might, you know, uh, Jefferson, lots of slaves, uh, all of the founding fathers had them. Uh, the idea of riling up, you know, the slave economy here with issues of independence was not something that uh, Jefferson, you know, the man that wrote our Bill of Rights, our Declaration of Independence, uh, could tolerate. You know, the, the, the thing about Haiti is that Haiti, you know, success of Haiti has never been in any other country's self-interest. You know, none of, nobody has found, even the other countries in the Caribbean and Latin America. Um, so it's had a very difficult 200 and more years. Um, I uh, think that, um, you know, the uh, cutting off of the aid to Haiti um, in um, uh, the end of 2000, beginning of 2001, was a death knell for Aristide. And I'm not, I don't actually have a brief for Aristide. I think it's still to be examined how he dealt with, um, uh, you know, the power that came to him. I think it's still very important that we look at that as a separate issue because there are some issues there. But nevertheless, you know, our country has this big policy about democracy around the world. And uh, it uh, claims that it will support democracy, it will even invade countries to establish it. And here is the United States virtually ousted, you know, a democratically elected, certified by them to be democratically elected uh, president. And it just is unacceptable. It's unacceptable. Um, so that's what I think about him. <laughs> In your speech, and just recently you mentioned uh, the United States' hypocritical position, hypocritical position on democracy. I was wondering whether in your work in setting up interim governments, you might favor more of a stance of advocating constitutional liberalism over simply having elections and democratic elections in places. What's your opinion of balancing those two values and creating? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure what you mean by constitutional liberalism. It, the entire concept, Fareed Zakaria discussed it one time about you know emphasizing the rule of law, basic rights. Um, the, the instead of uh, I'll take Bosnia and Serbia as an example. Instead of just having democratic elections, having elections with a government that respects and doesn't overstep its bounds and go outside of constitutional rights. Well, look, you know, I mean, uh, I know that, that that's no either or. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta have both of them. Um, I'm not, you know, elections are nice, neat little things when they work out nice and neatly. And I very rarely have seen that, um, even here. Uh, you know, uh, and I don't mean that offhand. I mean, I don't mean just Florida. <laughs> um, but elections are not enough. And um, they're not nearly enough. Um, if people
people can't read, what the hell is a, a ballot to them? If people are living in terror, you know, what do you mean go to the polls? If there is no rule of law, you know, what difference does it make that people have been elected to enforce it? Um, all of these things, all of these are rights that are inextricably linked, they're indivisible, indivisible. Now, I'm, you know, ballots and elections, I've been through a lot of them, um, and it is difficult to think of another way to judge popular choice of, can, of, of rulers. Uh, but that's about all you can say about that. All the rest of the things have to be there to make a democracy. And you've got to have choices, real choices, unlike what we have here. You know, and you've got to have people who are excited about controlling that and feel that they can make a difference. We don't have that here. That's why only 27% of the electorate goes to the polls. That's not exactly uh, democracy. We're gonna, can we take two more, these last two? Let's go to Jan and then we'll come back to you, okay? What, in your opinion, <coughs> is the relationship and the priorities for activists between uh, engaging in struggles over institutional racism at home, for instance, here at this university, and the global issues that you described in your talk. You mean which would I say is a priority? Well, I'm not exactly asking that. I, I'm more interested in what you think the relationship is and how they interact with each other. Or what you, if you want to say what priority, that's fine. <laughs> Well, you know, I think these are, uh, you know, these are false options, these either or. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, Eleanor Roosevelt said about the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights is that human rights begins close at home, in your backyard, you know, in your neighborhood. That you, you can't project out to the world or be to the world anything that you're not yourself. And, you know, I think that in as much as the U.S. plays a kind of dominant role, not just politically, economically, but also culturally, and when I say culturally, I mean like academic institutions of thought, et cetera, I, I'm not sure I see the, the you know, difference here between the struggle right here in the university and the struggle in the rest of, you know. I, I just, I think it's a, uh, a dreamer's uh, dichotomy of, of options. I don't think we have that luxury. Um, in your speech, uh, you talked about how the uh, multinational corporations and um, exactly the institutions have like, superseded national government. Um, but I, you also alluded to this when you were talking about Haiti. Uh, the U.S. also has like, a lot of influence, um, mainly the fact that the, a lot of the multinational corporations are U.S. corporations, and they have uh, a lot of influence over the World Bank and the IMF. Do um, you see their involvement with the international institutions as undermining, uh, I guess, the U.N. world as an international body? And do you see the U.S. Uh, sort of stepping down from the hegemonic wall in the future and allowing the UN to step up to its potential as a national government body? Well, you know, I think that the, um, in my view, there really is, can, you know, the, the UN is right now still the only um, a democrat, democratically constituted body of global policy making. At least the General Assembly is. Everybody's there. Everybody has one vote. And it's a little problem with the Security Council. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, the World Bank and the IMF, et cetera, are nowhere like that model. And um, yet the U.S. has dominant control uh, on the World Bank, for sure, IMF too. Um, and they, they sort of operate parallel to the UN as if 
uh, issues of international uh, peace and security don't have anything to do with the economic health of countries around the world. This is a total fallacy. Uh, Jim Wolfenson is as powerful in the you know, breakdown of you know, how countries survive and live and all as any other person, certainly than Kofi Annan. You know. uh, so it's, it is, I think that um, the power of the World Bank, IMF, and these international financial institutions are going to have to be put in check in some way by a more democratically constituted body that doesn't just represent wealth, but, you know, uh, uh, people, <laughs> countries and numbers, you know, on some uh, equal uh, basis. Um, otherwise, I don't think we have a hope uh, to um, uh, have a world that, you know, proceeds along the lines that uh, most people feel um, is accountable to their wishes. Please be safe going home.